Uh, we're interviewing uh, John H. Veer. It is uh, December 14, 2001. Interviewer is Michael Akey at Camp Smith. Mr. Veer, uh, where were you prior to the outbreak of World War II? What were you doing? I was just graduated from Georgetown and I graduated in June of 1941. And then I knew darn well that after World War I, a lot of the GIs who came home didn't have their same job. So I took about the first job offering, which was that of a Federal Reserve Bank examiner down on 33 Liberty Street in New York City. So I took that job. I didn't like it, but that was a job anyway. And uh, then, uh, of course, I was out hunting when uh, the uh, Japs struck Pearl Harbor on de December the 7th of 41, and so that got my Irish up. And so I decided I'm gonna quit my job Monday morning and then join up with the Marines or the Army or somebody. So I went at nine o'clock to the Federal Reserve Bank and told my boss I was quitting, and he said, good. And I went over to the Marines, and I was wearing glasses even then, so uh, they, they refused me. So I went over to Whitehall Street, where the Army Induction Center was, and they felt of me, and I was still warm, still a little bit alive, and so they signed me up. And then I went home for about two days, and then about two days later, they sent me out to uh, Camp Upton, out in Yaphank, Long Island. And uh, there are so darn many of us, so darn many of us volunteered at that particular little short period of time that they ran out of uniforms, and for the next few days I was walking around in civilian clothes, some of us in uniforms and some not. And then, shall I go on from there? Well, what was the general feeling of the camp at that point? This is right after Pearl Harbor. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, uh, these boys were mostly from New York City, and a lot of them were from around 3rd Avenue, and a lot of these guys were damn tough. Like the first night, I was in my bunk down the lower level, or over, overcrowded, something terrible, head to toe, uh, sleeping in these cots. And oh God, if if you bummed a cig, if you took a cigarette out of somebody's footlocker, bam, boy, there'd be a fight. These were tough cookies. So anyway, uh, uh, I learned to mind my P's and Q's, and then after about where they're not quite a full week, I think. And then I was, I told him I wanted to be in the artillery. I thought I could kill more Japs, and oh, I was out to kill Japs with artillery shells than I could with bullets. So then they sent me down to Fort Bragg, Fayetteville, North Carolina, from my basic training. And that was one big damn camp. I think, oh, at least 80,000 troops and all that stuff. So at any rate, that's where I got my basic training. And at the end of, I don't know, eight, week stint or whatever the heck it was, I had palled around with a guy named by, by the name of Johnny Adamkowitz, and uh, he was a tough Polak. And uh, so many of these guys in, in, in this generation, to impress somebody, they'd say, oh yeah, I used to be a bootlegger. I'd say they're a little bit older than I was, and I was about 23, 24 at that time. <laughs> and anyway, they said to Adamkowitz and myself, now look at this group, your, your own group is moving out and we're going to keep you here and when the next group comes in, we're going to make cadre out of you. So we were gung-ho and we wanted action. We wanted to be with a line outfit and all that stuff. So uh, Dan Puss and I thought, well, we're, we're pretty smart guys. What we'll do is raise all kinds of hell and they won't want us. Well. <laughs> I got a pass to go home for one weekend. I came back with a bunch of booze, and he had gotten some booze. So the next several days, maybe almost two weeks, oh, God, we managed to get awful damn drunk. And Adamkowitz was the kind of a guy that you, you didn't fool around with him. Uh, he would, he'd, he'd fight the drop of a hat. So anyway, one night we were passed out, and uh, somebody called down from CQ. Uh, Veer and Adamkowitz report to CQ immediately. So we go down there with a hangover and still drunk. And uh, they sent Adamkowitz down, well, both of us down to the train station. And Adamkowitz took one, they put him on one train going to some outfit in Virginia. And they put me on another out, uh, other train. And I went down to Augusta, Georgia. 
And uh, there was a, car, a, a Corporal Friedman waiting for me. I got in there about uh, quarter to five in the morning. And I didn't have much sleep. And because all of a sudden there's so, such an influx of men coming into the army, they took out of mothballs old, old railroad coaches. And these coaches, no baloney, had the old original uh, gas light fixtures hanging down, and they just simply strung up electric light bulbs, and that was it. Now you have electricity in there. And they still had uh, some old steam engines. And these windows were so worn out and open at the bottom that the soot sometimes used to come through and you'd be brushing your uniform off like this. So I got down to um, uh, about a quarter to five, Augusta, Georgia, and this Corporal Freeman picked me up with the uh, Jeep, brought me up to camp there, and uh, they, uh, they, this was the 4th Infantry Division, and I was assigned to uh, Battery C of the 44th Field Artillery Battalion. And these out, this outfit was reactivated in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama about eight months before I joined them. So all the non-compositions were taken up and all that. And uh, these were real southern boys from the, they were hillbillies. And tougher than hell. And these guys too, like I told you about the Third Avenue boys, oh, they'd fight at the drop of a hat. And as I learned quickly, as I mentioned before, you stay the hell away from some other guy's footlocker, otherwise Jesus cots would go roll, rolling. And you were used to flesh on flesh and all that stuff. What was it like uh, to be a Yankee in that group? All right, I'll tell you, good point, Mike. Uh, so anyway, I guess it was my first lunch. Lunch was dinner in this mess hall. And so one of these Southern crackers came up alongside of me. He was from uh, uh, North Carolina. And he was a hard shell Baptist. And he said, Veer, Veer, uh, where the hell are you from? And I said, I'm from uh, White Plains, New York. And he said, Jesus Christ, out loud to, for everybody's benefit. Did you hear that? He's a goddamn blankety blank Yankee. Then he said to me, uh, What's your religion, Veer? And I said, I'm a Roman Catholic. God damn, fellas, did you hear that? You couldn't be any lower in those Baptist eyes than if you were a Yankee and from and a Catholic from New York. Oh, you couldn't be any lower. So anyway, uh, uh, I finally won their confidence, but it took months and months. And another thing, too, I learned, if some guy is a big, fat guy, don't underestimate his strength. Immediately because I was brand new, and a Yankee and a Catholic to boot, can't get any lower. Uh, I was put on KP for one week. I mean, you got your ass out of bed at 4.30, you were in the goddamn kitchen working uh, at 5, and they didn't let you out of there until about oh, 11, 11.30, damn near 12 o'clock. <coughs> I learned you lose weight that way too. But about the second or third day, an army supply truck <coughs> pulled in, dropped off all these bags of sugar and a lot of other stuff. And this big fat boy I was with, Reedy was his name, and he was from Richmond, Virginia. And the funny part, can I take a swig of this? For you. Good, thank you. Uh, I'm talking too much as usual. <laughs> Thanks very much. But anyway, he was, his father was a detective, and this guy was a thug, no other word to describe him. So, we went down these five steps from the KP, and all the stuff was out on the ground. And this son of a gun took one hand, big hand, and he put it down on one 100-pound bag of sugar. The other hand, another 100-pound bag of sugar. And that bastard picked both of them up, put them on his shoulder, and walked up those five steps into the goddamn mess hall like I was carrying a piece of paper or something like that. And uh, we had a uh, sergeant we called him Bulldog, I forget his real name now. He too was a uh, southern boy, and again, as I mentioned before, guys who are a little bit older than me, if they want to make a impression, they say, yeah, during Prohibition, I was a bootlegger. And so this guy claimed the same thing. He had a build on him like crazy. God, he had shoulders and massive chest, practically no uh, waist to him at all. 
And uh, he was in the Army for several years. He was a real old-time, regular Army first sergeant. And uh, oh, he could do close water drill like crazy. He was good. So to get hung with it, this guy, uh, John, uh, I guess his first name was John, really anyway, uh, he was always getting goddamn drunk. And so you had to be back, you're supposed to be back like 12 o'clock or whatever. And during the winter months, even down there, it would be inky black when you had to be out on the drill field uh, to, for roll call and all that. And what they'd do, the first sergeant call out, Veer! And I'd say, ah, you know, they know that. So they called out, really. There was no goddamn really to be seen in the ranks. And then, this is a drill field. All of a sudden, we could see this inky black st still. We could see, here comes old Reedy, drunker than the Lord, swagging around and all that. And the first sergeant, old chewed his ass out, something terrible. And then the two of them damn near squared off. It would have been the battle of the century. And uh, then some of the other sergeants broke it up. But they put him back into our ranks. And of course, it was all short order drill. But left flank, uh, right flank, uh, and prefer, uh, about face. This guy really was of his size. He was knocking down other GIs, because he was always going the wrong goddamn way. And, uh, well, anyway, uh, they, we were alerted. We were supposed to go over to North Africa, uh, like with the first and ninth and all that stuff. But at the last minute, we were canceled out. And then uh, we went up to Fort Sill. See, I was in the artillery. For, that's an artillery base, Fort Sill, out there for more training. And then I guess we went to uh, Camp uh, Kilmer for a little while, oh, no, up to Fort Dix in New Jersey. Then we shipped out and on the, uh, on a big convoy. And anyway, uh, because I was out of the artillery, uh, the English ship, and uh, they decided to put me in a turret. What they call a turret is not an enclosed turret at all. You're out in the goddamn open. All they do is a little bit of a platform, say, on the side of the ship, and they just put some pipe around you, and either you had a 20 millimeter or a 40 millimeter uh, gun, and uh, you'd practice those things in the daylight. Uh, like you'd fire one shot up and poof, it would burst, and you had smoke up there. Now hit the smoke. That's how you got your practice in. But anyway, one night I had the graveyard shift on this one particular so-called turret. I think I had a 40 millimeter that night. And all of a sudden, oh God, it was a big goddamn convoy. And I looked over to my left, and Jesus, there was something coming through the water. At night, on the water, the ocean, when you ruffle up that water, you ruff, ruffle up uh, phosphorus. And so I thought, Jesus Christ, that's a goddamn U-boat that's with his periscope up. And I saw, I took aim, but I was told, I was given orders, before you open fire, there's a telephone next to you. Call down to the officer at the other end of that wire. So I called down, I said, I'm about to open fire, there's a goddamn U-boat periscope. I got my sights right on him, and I'm going to fire. Oh, this guy got excited like crazy. And oh, British accent, all that stuff. And he... Uh, told me to hold my fire and chewed my ass out at the same time. And what they do in a convoy like that is they'll take a long rope, I guess they call it a lanyard, and they'll tie a log behind it. And then at the stern of the boat, they'll throw it out in the water. And that thing will tow behind, be towed behind that boat, maybe a hundred yards, whatever the hell they want. And that is to keep boats behind you in the convoy from coming up in the inky, inky black of night and ramming your stern. So that was it. And of course, oh yeah, uh, they packed us in like flies. Uh, it was a passenger ship originally, but oh geez, there'd be one bunk right here, about this high above, be another, another, so on. So if you ever raise your head too fast, it's like you'd wrap your head against some steel above you. And uh, so then uh, you had to bathe sometime, but of course, fresh water was precious on these troop ships. So uh, anyway, uh, is it right to use one certain term? <laughs> all right, okay. You had an, your helmet had an insert. If you popped the insert out, all you had was the steel helmet inside. So you'd be given just a little bit of water, and you'd strip down bare ass, and then you'd bathe yourself starting from the head right down to your toes. 
<laughs> you'd squeeze out a, I guess it was a sponge or something, and, or a rag, whatever, and oh Jesus, that water was inky black by the time you got down to your goddamn feet. And so we landed in um, Southampton, England, uh, the 31st of uh, January of uh, 44, and then we're sent over to Newton Abbott, and that was right on the channel. It was a sea, uh, seashore resort next to Torquay. Torquay was even better known. And in the inky black of night. And so, all right, we got settled down there. And my best buddy was a guy named Dresback from Ohio. And uh, anyway, uh, we got a pass after we were there two or three days to go on into Newton Abbott and uh, go to the pubs and all that crap. So uh, back in those days, it was funny. It, Tell your buddies, hey, let's go to town tonight and get goddamn good and drunk. And Jesus, you would do exactly that. But anyway, we got into this one pub, and everything's all inky black around you. All things blacked out. So uh, anyhow, there are a couple of little uh, Scottish soldiers, kilts and all that stuff. They were small men. And of course, they're already in their cups. They're already drunk. And uh, the English. The English and the Australian Marines, they were big bastards. They had to be at a minimum of six feet tall. And boy, they knew how to use their, wear their uniforms. And boy, when they'd stop, they'd click their heels. Boy, you could hear that sharp crack. They, they were good soldiers. But anyway, uh, these two little Scotsmen, drunker than hell, uh, they knew that we were yanks. And they said, yanks, do you know who we hate? We'd rather fight more than the goddamn Jerry's. The goddamn blimeys, these guys, these goddamn cherries, they're no goddamn good. You know, the Scots and the Welsh and the Irish, all three, they're Celtics. And boy, they, their memories go back generations. They, they don't forget easily. So I thought to myself, oh, geez, this is going to be bloodshed. These big Englishmen, six feet and more, they could wipe the floors with these guys. <laughs> but they, I learned, have a lot of patience, more so than an American, because well, you, you and I would, boom, I can you know, talk like that to me. And no, nothing happened at all. But uh, anyway, we had our basic, uh, no, not basic training, but we were there till, oh, the end, yeah, the end of May. And then we're sent to a big marshalling area. That was to wait there to get on the LCTs and the LSTs and all that kind of stuff. And uh, one day, uh, some British commandos came into the camp, and they were to teach us hand-to-hand -hand combat. Well, let me tell you, good gentlemen, one thing. They were a tough bunch of bastards. They were no bigger than the three of us were. But anyway, one of them seemed to be the leader. Uh, I don't know why he picked on me, but he said, Hi there, yank! And he came towards me with his hand extended, and I thought, in friendship. So I grabbed his hand. He gave, he pulled, grabbed my hand, gave me a pull, he gave me his hip, I went ass over tea kettle, and skipping down the goddamn hard dirt and all that stuff. And um, they proceeded to teach us, what it comes down to is dirty tricks. Because you know, when they went into like Dieppe and those kind of places, they had to contend with German guards and how to come up behind them and all that stuff. And uh, if you want to hear, I'll tell you some dirty tricks I learned or they taught me, put it that way. And one thing was, uh, they said, the first thing though, know, you never keep your strap from your steel helmet connected underneath that clip. You take those two loose straps and you snap them together behind your helmet, because here is why. And if you came up behind a German, he's a guard, say, you reach over the front of his head and snap the helmet back, you break his goddamn neck. Not just hurt him, but you break his goddamn neck. Then they showed us, sir, I'm telling you this for a special reason. Uh, and if somebody comes up and gives you the bear hug, and you can't break out of it, well, there's several ways of breaking out. The first one that comes to your mind, of course, is you bring your knee up and hit him in the balls. But then if you take the, like, the side of your foot and rake him down the shin like that, and of course you can right down onto his foot too. That is awfully goddamn painful. And then uh, if you can get your hands just free enough to get up around his ears, you clap his ears, and you don't just hurt him, you break his goddamn eardrums. Or if you can get your two fingers under the nostrils of his nose, you can really literally lift his nostrils right off his goddamn nose. 
and they taught us uh, what you should do. Yikes! Is go along, you're walking along, and you hold the left hand out, and you take the right hand, and you want to build this muscle up right here. And you just keep doing this all day long. And they did have muscle right in there. That's so you can give a guy a chop across the Adam's apple. That's another trick and all that stuff. Now, let me just jump ahead. Uh, I'll get back to the war in a minute. But anyway, uh, those things were instilled in my mind. So I got discharged on October 29th of 45. Went home, and uh, this one particular evening, I was all by myself, my buddy Gene Healy, I don't know where he was, but anyway, I came into this bar grill, and I saw a couple of, not really old friends, but old acquaintances. So, you know, we both said, hi, hi. So there were two of them, and I sat down opposite them, and, uh, oh, one was facing the other, that was it. So I sat on side of one of them, and so we're just telling each other where, what outfits we were in, and whether we're in the Pacific or the ETO, and all that kind of crap. And then I guess one guy came, a little bit bigger than myself, came up to the booth that we're in, and I thought he was buddy-buddy with these other two guys. And he just slid in. Nobody invited him, he slid in. And so, anyway, they said, Veer, where the hell were you? So I told them, just give it to him the way it was. And this guy said, uh, you're full of shit. And I said, look at buddy, those are fighting words. Don't you talk like that to me. And I said, don't like, I was wearing glasses. And I said, don't look like goddamn glasses. Stop you. I put my glasses down. I said, you take the first goddamn crack. You see what the goddamn hell happens to you. And geez, I have my glasses on what you doing? Didn't do a goddamn thing until I reached for my glasses and went like this. Oh, he popped me one across the top of the eye. Boy, he really opened up my eyebrow, no question about that. So I threw the whole goddamn table over on him and one of these other guys. <laughs> and make a long story short, went out on the street. We were pushed out on the street by the waiters and all that. And we had, uh, well actually it came down to three fights. And I whipped his ass the first two fights. Then, uh, you know what's funny, when you get into a fight like that with somebody, Jesus, if you, it, it's kill or be killed. That's the first thing you're taught in the army. Kill or be killed. And then after you got the upper hand, you know, well, shit, should I keep beating them or what the hell do I do next? So I twice foolishly said to him, let that be a goddamn lesson to you. You watch your goddamn tongue. And he, the third time we had the fight, he went back inside. He said, that son of a bitch is just plain lucky. I can whip his ass. I said, you get your goddamn ass out in the street. And of course, what I was doing to him, he didn't realize I was pulling the same goddamn dirty tricks that the British commandos taught me. Like I'd kick him in the stomach, and he'd double up and then knock the shit out of his face. I think he was better than I was at fighting, at, at boxing. But even though I, was, I grew up as a skinny kid, I could always wrestle. I never had my ass beaten yet in wrestling. But I never went to college or high school where they had, you know, real, true wrestling. I'm just talking street fights and all that stuff. So anyway, Jesus, uh, uh, oh yeah, what happened was, this time I had him down again, and I had his head, and I started to wrap his head on the goddamn concrete pavement, and all of a sudden, two goddamn headlights come right up, right up to me. This is a car, of course, and two cops jumped out. One cop grabbed me from one side, the other cop from the other side, and pulled me off. They didn't make any arrests, they just chewed our asses out and all that. So by the time I got home, this goddamn cut on my eye, it was really a cut, it was bleep, bleep, bleep. And I had just bought a brand new suit. I'm talking 1946, was it, or 47. It was a Memorial Day, I remember that, the holiday. And so, Jesus, I had a brand new $35 Robert Hall suit on. It was all blood, torn, <laughs> and knees were out and all that crap. So my father was a uh, surgeon. He was chief of staff of St. Agnes Hospital in White Plains for about 20 years or so. And he led a respectable life. So I get my ass in bed, I have my goddamn bloody clothes all tucked away under the bed, and I'm laying my back on my back and bleep, bleep, bleep. So I knew goddamn well need stitches. So I get these same goddamn bloody torn up clothes on, and I go over to St. Agnes Hospital, five in the morning. And of course the first thing they want to know, what's your name and where do you live? And of course, <laughs> Jack Veer, oh, Dr. Veer, son, yeah. So anyway, I got patched up and what a big goddamn bandage over my eye. And my older brother, yeah, he, he was ordained. He was a priest at the time. He had another priest friend with him. 
for breakfast. See, this other priest stayed over that night anyway. I come down to the breakfast table. Oh, Jesus, beat up, bruised, <laughs> bandaged, all that stuff. The outcast of the family. But, of course, what I'm telling you the story for is those goddamn dirty tricks that the British commandos taught me <laughs> came in good stead. But getting back to combat, uh, we went over to Dartmouth, England. And that's where we loaded up on the boats early, very early in the morning before it did sunrise. And uh, God, after we got out into the channel, it was tremendously uh, impressive to see the size of it. And then to see the fleets of thousands of airplanes, our aircraft, going over to the shore. And then as we got closer to the shore, these big battle, I'm talking battle ships themselves, not cruising, battleships, they were behind us. Oh, Jesus Christ, the noise, and you see the flare. But when those 16-inch shells went over you, it sounded like, to me, like a goddamn freight train going over. Walla, 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 walla. And what they would do, they used delayed action fuses on them. And of course, the delayed action fuse will not detonate but the very second it hits something hard. It'll detonate maybe just two seconds later. But those two seconds, that barrels into rock, ground, or anything, and then goes off. And the craters that those goddamn things left were so big that later, when the guys went ashore with trucks and everything like that, they could get out of the small arms fire range by going down there. And they also set up temporary command posts down in there. That's how big they were. What was uh, going through your mind as you were coming across the channel? Oh, I thought, this is pretty serious stuff now. And uh, it was. But uh, i tell you what, I wasn't so, wasn't as afraid then. And anyone who says I wasn't afraid in combat is a goddamn friggin' liar. Anyway, uh, then when I got on shore, that's when fear hit me. Where did you land? In uh, Utah Beachhead, St. Mary Iglesias. And we were sort of married off that day to the 82nd Airborne. They were dropped in behind us. And as you probably know, uh, there were an awful lot of mistakes made when they dropped off those poor bastards on the 82nd. And uh, so we went into, May I, I came ashore actually about 11 o'clock. So they were, all, they already had secured the beachhead. Uh, Omaha was worse, but Utah was no Sunday picnic either. And uh, so and one of the first things that impressed me where I realized I was in trouble, uh, several, not one, but several in, in a group like uh, these 82nd Airborne troops were deader than hell, they had parachuted out, and their parachutes got caught up in the tops of some of these trees. And uh, then the, the Germans just simply machine gunned them to death. And these poor bastards, they had their heads down, they, you've got the feeling they're looking at you. And their bodies were just swaying back and forth with the breeze and all that stuff. And uh, then uh, one of the next things I remember very clearly I could hear a machine gun, one of our own machine guns, going off close to me. I, I didn't see it, but I knew where the sound was coming from. And what happened was another one of these poor paratroopers had landed way in, and he came upon a German staff car with the keys still in the ignition. So this poor bastard thought it would be quite a lark to get in that command car and come back into our lines and show it off. And of course, as soon as the, these guys, the Americans, and little bit of the nest they had, sort of a staff car coming out, German markings across and all that kind of stuff. They opened up, and this poor bastard, he only got as far as his hand on the uh, door knob to open and close the door, and he had it open, and he went flying out, ass over teacup, up against the bank, oh God. He was riddled, the car was riddled, and all that stuff. But then the Germans put a few uh, uh, 88s close to us, that was the meanest, goddamn, for me, most feared weapon of the whole goddamn war. It had a tremendous speed to it, way above the speed of sound. And, all right, well, that, that goddamn gun was invented by the Germans in the early, right after Hitler took over. And when they went down, uh, Hitler volunteered the troops down in the Spanish Civil War, uh, 1936 and 37. And they, the Germans were smart. They quickly realized that goddamn gun that had been invented for an ACAC, anti-aircraft, uh, they could use it like uh, against, they could pick a trench apart with that. 
And then they realized that was a mean goddamn weapon to put on the front of tanks. So when uh, we came ashore with Sherman tanks, oh Jesus, there was no, there was no contest. The only thing that Ger the Sherman tanks were good for was uh, they were uh, produced by mass production, so they could make them fast. We need them fast, oh, okay. And also they had hydraulically driven turrets. They could turn around with hydraulic. Uh, whereas the German tanks, they had to crank them. But uh, the, I, I've seen it myself, uh, and the German tanks had much more armor on the front of them. I've seen these puny, goddamn World War I, okay, uh, uh, tank uh, shells. That means a solid projectile. Hit the front of a German tank, fing, just ricochet right the hell off. But not so with a goddamn 88. That son of a bitch went through a goddamn turret ready part, making a very clean hole in and a clean hole going out. And uh, as I said, I think uh, anybody inside the tank was uh, de destined to be killed because the, shell, the steel that was taken out by that hole would shatter all through the interior of a tank. And if you look down inside them and see all these dead GIs, they're about five, I think, their uniforms were all puffed out like this. Uh, like one time uh, when we were either married off to the second armored or the fourth armored, one of those outfits. Again, you get on the back of them like 4.30 in the morning before it got daylight. And then uh, because I was an artillery forward observer, uh, I was always on about the third, maybe the fourth tank. I heard I wanted to be on the first tank because that first tank was almost destined to be knocked out. The Germans were goddamn past masters at camouflage, and they knew that the road coming up to them was only like a single lane, and they'd be beautifully camouflaged around the bend. And that first poor goddamn tank of ours would be sure to be knocked out, and probably the second one too. So it was my position with my two men to get your ass off when that happened, the tank stopped, and then to adjust artillery fire. You knew about where that tank was and you try to get artillery fire out at that point. But, uh, and sticking to these uh, tanks, uh, we had, I think at this day, uh, it was just before we got out of the hedgerow country, uh, we had a, a battalion of tanks tank destroyers uh, behind us as support. And see, uh, because as a port observer, I only had to take care of three different rifle companies. It was the uh, 22nd Infantry Regiment out of the 4th Infantry Division. And I could go from K to M to I at my own will. I didn't take any orders from the company, rifle companies, commanders. I took orders from my captain back at my battery. So anyway, this one day, uh, we, I knew we had tanks behind us. So I got up to this position with K Company, I think it was, Captain Wiley, I think. And so anyway, he said, look at there, we know goddamn well there are crap tanks over there in that next ridge line there. Uh, but, uh, cover us with artillery fire. And I said, well, what I'll do is I'll fire white phosphorus shells. Now, white phosphorus will burn the goddamn hide off you, burn the clothes off you, and also it will serve like as a smoke screen to give you some protection. So I could make out just about where they were. So I called my commands down through the radio, and, uh, and the procedure is, when you're in a position like mine, you only ask for one round, and what you do, you find the coordinates on your map. Uh, you know, these coordinates would be like a, a battle map with lines drawn in tighter, and they knew that was a hillside. So, all right, and I had a good idea where our battery was located, because you had to figure angles coming across like this. Then you start to get mixed up with left and right and over and short. So, uh, uh, you ask for one round, then pick up the error with that and say, 100, you, you always gave the error, you didn't give the corrections. 100 yards left, 50 yards short. They do the arithmetic back at the battery and then another round. And then when you figure you were on target, then you say, fire for effect. I wasn't getting any goddamn 
uh, response at all. No, no, sh no shells coming over, nothing at all. So then I started cursing, raise hell the radio, and all this kind of stuff. This went on and on. So finally, this Captain Wiley's came over. He said, Veer, we can't wait any longer. We got to jump off. And I said, well, Jesus Christ, I don't know what the hell else to do. So we jumped off. And then the tanks behind us came over this crest. And they started to come down. And that's when the Germans, with their tanks, they pulled them up on us. They knocked the shit out of our tanks. And uh, all right, uh, while the action was still going on, you always crouch. This is still hedgerow, so you always about yay high. Uh, you always crouch down, make less of a target. And that was that. And God damn it, my helmet hit something hard. I heard bonk, and I looked up, and Jesus, there was a goddamn German tank just knocked out, and the barrel was beautifully camouflaged with a vine. They wrapped a vine. You couldn't see it until you were right on top of the goddamn thing. Well, here's what happened. The tragic note of all of this kind of the story was this. We lost 17 tanks and we lost 55 tankers. Tankers being the men in the goddamn tank. So, oh, I was tearing us. And look at that, my captain, Captain Higgins was my commanding officer. Back there. He and I were buddies. So I didn't pull my gun out on him, but I had a 45. And I, pulled, I said, God damn it, Higgins, I'm going to kill the son of a bitch, the goddamn bastard who didn't give me firepower. Why didn't I get firepower? I was livid. And so he said, take it easy, Veer, take it easy. I always had quite a temper. So what it all came down to, to come to the point, was that the 28th Infantry Division was on our left flank. And some of the 28th raided over to our outfit that uh, they had troops at this one point where I wanted to fire my artillery, which was bullshit. And so uh, he, they, they told me that story. So I said, God damn it, if I can find the bastards over there, I'm going to kill them because they killed 55 of our boys and we lost 17 goddamn tanks. That's why I say our tanks, not until we got the Patton tank. That might be a Patton out in front there. Should you just say, let's switch tanks. Oh. That's, uh, that's an MC. Um, tell me, what was, tell me about the Bocage. What was it actually like? What was what like? The Bocage, the hedgerows. Oh, the hedgerows. Uh, that, all right, I guess for centuries, in Normandy anyway, uh, they were earth walls and a lot of vegetation would grow into them to, to support them, to hold them up. And uh, they were, although it was no one set distance apart, but uh, it made a beautiful goddamn defense for the enemy. Because, geez, a few goddamn troops behind that could take care of a hell of a lot more guys coming at them. And they were hard as hell to, to see. Did you expect to see these hedgerows? No. Now, we were never told anything about the goddamn hedgerows. But speaking about the hedgerows now, and tell me when to stop. Uh, there was one guy, rifleman, that, oh boy, uh, I, I thought was crazy. When I go forward, or practically anybody go forward, you would hold right along, ducking down a hedgerow to get to. From this point to that point, you go right along the hedgerow over and then go fast across there. And this one GI I noticed he did it more than once. He was walking right the hell through the middle of the hedgerow, uh, uh, the, the field between the hedgerows. So to get ahead of my story now, uh, it was about the, not the 12th, that was the first time I was hit of July, but right in that period of time, uh, we took a, uh, a small barn, it was the big small, they had a very small annex on one side of it. And this, I, see, I went from corporal to second lieutenant. I never was a sergeant. And anyway, uh, I was working underneath a guy named Shower. He was an Alabama boy, tall, lanky fellow, and a real southern accent. And, uh, okay, so we knew that there were SS troops right in front of us. It was the first time we ever heard the creaking and the groaning of a German tank right close by to us. And uh, then we suddenly realized this one tree right in front of us was loaded with uh, German snipers. They had their camouflage capes on and all this. They were hard to pick out. They could have had a thick tree with loads of leaves on it. It was hard as hell to find them. So anyway, this Lieutenant Charlie went up into this very small little attic and he had a little small aperture, a little window up there. And then I, uh, there's a front 
open front door doorway here in the front, one right behind it. So Jesus, if you got in the front doorway, you were silhouetted perfectly for a sniper. So anyway, I ran and I grabbed like that wall, on the back tight against the wall, and uh, I uh, didn't have the radio. But the other enlisted man was out behind the rear door with the radio. So Shower would call down to me the coordinates, and I'd relay them out to the guy in the back. And getting back to this one guy that I thought was taking unnecessary chances, he was on, I'm looking forward now, on my left, right along, hugging that door, open front door. And the other guy was a big burly first lieutenant from Missouri. I got to know him just a little bit. And he was right in front of me, so he was on this side of the door. So we put white phosphor shells out there. Oh, Jesus, that got effect. Those goddamn crowds came scar scampering down as fast as they could. And anyhow, these two guys took their M1s and uh, pop, 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 pop. Of course, these M1s held a clip of eight. And uh, anyway, this big husky first lieutenant, he ran out of ammo first. He called over to the other guy who had a bandolier on him with all these clips. He said, give me more ammo. And don't ever ask me why, because if I live the other, I'll never know why. This poor bastard stepped out from where he was to the open doorway to hand him the goddamn clip. Bam! Just like that. This crowd shot him between the eyes. His helmet went flying. He was physically picked up off his feet, and his back came slamming up against a barrel that I could put my hand on, and that barrel supported him upright like this. And uh, he just slumped his head over. Of course, that is hell. And I looked down into his head. The whole goddamn top of his head was removed, and I was always like a sissy looking at particularly somebody else's blood. My blood didn't bother me as much as yours or yours. So I looked down there, and plip, plip, plip. I had blood, pieces of brain, I guess, and everything else, on my shoes and on the bottom of my trousers. And I thought, oh shit, I'm gonna faint now. So I managed to get a slug of water into me, and uh, I, I was still very, very shaky at, at all. And his goddamn helmet just continued to spin around like that, like a, like a top, a child's top, and all that. So when I got my ass out of there, I got my ass out of there fast as hell through that goddamn uh, door. And, uh, well, uh, I'll tell you, the uh, dirtiest place that we, uh, the 28th Infantry, the first was there, the ninth was there, was taking the Hurtgen Forest in Germany. That was just across, like, the Luxembourg uh, line, and uh, it was dense as hell. And what you worried about the most, because it took by far the greatest casualties, were shell bursts going up in the trees above you. Because, Jesus, when a goddamn shell goes up over you, it just showers the goddamn ground. If you're in a slip trench, you can still get it. Uh, so uh, that was the biggest worry. Now getting back there, Lieutenant Schauer, who was up in that little attic of that barn I just got through telling you about, uh, he had one outfit, and by this time I had got my, I was an acting gadget. I wasn't sworn in, but I was now considered a second lieutenant, and I had two men under me. So one day, uh, we took our objective this one day. It wasn't very far we got. And I got a radio message up to me saying that Lieutenant Shower was killed and I should go over there and take over his team of two men. So when I got over there, what had happened was the Germans only threw a few goddamn mortars over, not very many. They always did that just while you're digging in. And this poor bastard Shower, he dug a slit, was, was digging a slit trench. And because it was so cold and rainy and crappy, uh, you'd get two, maybe three, into a slip trench. So, so this side of you was getting the body warmth of this guy, and then you'd get somebody to flip over and go the other way. So he, these two enlisted men were a little bit teed off, not, not a little, but they were teed off at this guy because he said to them, go out and get some goddamn boughs. And because of these tree bursts, uh, branches of these pine trees were always coming down. So what you'd do, you'd lay these boughs across the slip trench, and that little dirt that you had dug up, you'd put it on top of the boughs and squeeze in and just hope to God that would be enough to stop any fr shell fragmentation. So what happened, these two guys are out and they're getting boughs 
And they knew a mortar came in pretty close to them. This one goddamn mortar came in to the slip trench, hit this guy, Lieutenant Shower, and blew him to smithereens. And I was told to pick up whatever little effects there were, and I guess the graveyard crew would pick up their remains. So I found my way over to the slip trench, and I asked these two GIs, I said, where in hell is Shower? Where is his body? And they said, under the raincoat. So I took the raincoat off. All that was left of this guy, this is on my mother's grave, I swear to God, was the stump of a head, two bare hands, and two bare feet. That meant the concussion took his combat boots that go up to about here on you, blew them off as his socks, and two bare feet. That's all that was left of that poor bastard. Now I'm going to jump ahead. Uh, the last time I got hit was March the 2nd. And after being patched up at an evacuation uh, uh, hospital in Luxembourg, I was flown over to Bristol where I had another operation. I literally am half-assed because I had my left buttocks shot off. Nobody remembers I had two shots in the uh, uh, shoulder and one in the head. My head so hard, nothing could ever penetrate that. So anyway, uh, I was sent over to Bristol, had another operation, and I was sent up to Bronze Grove for a convalescent hospital. And my younger brother was a, a lieutenant in the infantry, and he had been banged up. He was down in Salisbury. Salisbury in England was like our West Point, a very permanent uh, post, big post. So anyway, now I'm a big shot. Uh, I still, I'm still a second boy. Anyway, I'm down there. So he says, let's go off to the bar and have a drink. Now I'm a big shot. So I'm off to the bar and having a drink with him. And all of a sudden, I swear to God, it was the most eerie feeling I ever had in my life. There was, I, one guy was talking. I could swear to God, that was Lieutenant Shower's voice. So anyway, I went over to him. I tapped him on the shoulder. I don't know, he's the first Louis or Cap, whatever the hell he was. Anyway, I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, Thank your pardon, sir, for the intrusion. I said, but by any goddamn crazy ass chance, could you be uh, a shower? He said, yes, sir. He said, I sure am. He said, why do you want to ask that question? And I told him what had happened to his brother. He said, well, I'll be goddamn. He said, thank you. Thank you for telling me. He, he, he was daddy's boy, and I'll sure tell daddy how he died. Thank you very much. Now. Suppose I had gone to Jimmy the Greek, the gambler, and said, what are the odds that I could ever find his brother just out of the clear blue sky with thousands, thousands of troops still in England itself? But was the same? This guy was built differently. He had a very husky build and all that kind of stuff. But uh, oh, the Hurricane Forest was rainy, was snowy, and uh, oh, Jesus, you couldn't send out patrols to see what was out ahead of you because you get lost. There's all nothing but, and of course what happened, you go into an attack and oh shit, they're being, what do they call it, cortina, and they, these rolls of wire, barbed wire, and all this kind of Constantino. crap. Concertino. Concertino, that's, that's it, yeah. Hey, I want to hold this, I'll talk here no, at five o'clock. No, you've got to two thirty. Oh, all right. Um, you got a battlefield commission? Yeah, I did. Well, how, how, how did you get that? All right, well, first of all, I went in on D-Day, the first one week, I was a survey corporal. And then there was a, oh, a hell of a nice guy, built like crazy. A Lieutenant Waugh, another Southern boy, and another guy with another Irish name. And it's a funny thing down south. I'm not talking religion now, but I'm just talking the facts. Uh, see, when the railroads were built going down south, uh, a lot of Irish immigrants came in. They were Catholics. And then they got ahead of the priests. They get down to some little southern town, and there's only one church, maybe a Baptist church, and boy, if you wanted to socialize or be accepted, you had to be one of them. So there are a lot of names would be southern boys in my outfit. That would be Irish as hell, but not Catholics. So anyway, uh, uh, what you asked me what now again? You uh, you got a battlefield? Oh, you battlefield Christian, yeah. So one day uh, we had lost our lieutenant, who was in over me in the Hurricane Forest. And anyway, uh, my captain called up and said, Veer, you're going to be an acting gadget. That meant the, uh, I had all the authority of a second lieutenant. But I actually was not sworn in until, I think it was the eighth day of uh, January of 95, but I had my own outfit, my own little group, two guys in a group. And you mentioned hedgerows before. These guys.
goddamn radios operated on great big clumsy heavy old batteries. They were 70 pounds. What, how they make them would be like in two halves. One was about 40 pounds, one was about 30, close to that. And so when you got to your destination where you want to use them, you take uh, two, uh, ma a male and a female coupling and give that like a quarter turn and you would have it. So this one particular day, it was the uh, 12th of July, and uh, okay, I wasn't a, I was not an officer then, so I'm supposed to man that. And what it, 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 this is also we ran up against SS troops, and what the Krauts did in two wars actually, they each time the British uh, outgunned them like at Jutland in World War One, the Battle of Jutland, and they the German Navy was bottled up, and what they would do with these battle uh, pocket battleships that had big goddamn guns on them to take the guns off them, mount them on flat cars, I'm talking freight trains, flat cars, and then an engine would take them up to wherever they wanted to be. And they had like 20 miles, 22 mile ranges, and goddamn accurate too. It was one day, boy, we knew that this was big stuff coming in on us. And again, see, not in 88, that's ahead of the sound, but not these big, slower, large shells. And you could hear them coming in. My ear became very much attuned to how far away they were. And this one guy, well, they, they were using these big shells. And one uh, shell came over and hit in a tree, almost, not quite, almost over my head. So when I heard that coming in, I ran for the goddamn hedgerow. And I thought my left arm, forearm here, hit a root in one of these scrub trees growing out of the hedgerow. And so, uh, okay. Then I felt down here, and it was warm, and I had a sweet delight. So I went back to the first aid station, not far back of this. All I had to do was just take my shirt up, my sleeve off, and wrap. They put a few stitches in and wrapped it up, and so I came back to where I was located. And anyway, it was a very nice, clean-looking uh, second lieutenant. And to see somebody clean, shaven, that was very unusual, because we all had almost as much as you've got in your face. And not on purpose, but because you couldn't get near a razor. So anyway, this nice looking uh, second lieutenant said to me, hey soldier, he said, uh, are you all right? I said, yeah. He said, tell me what happened. Oh, Jesus, I was using the English language like you can't believe the F and this and the, oh, Jesus. I, oh, I was really going at great length. And so his smile got bigger and bigger. So he finally said to me, he said, uh, soldier, would you like to go to a confession? I said, yeah, but where the goddamn blankety blank 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 place can you go to confession around here? He said, right here. Blank, blank. I said, oh, are you blank blank? Chaplain said, yeah. I said, Father, I think you've heard it all. There's not much more I can tell you than what you've already heard there. And the funny part was, uh, I got back to my radio, and uh, I could not receive anything. I was barking orders and screaming and yelling, going crazy into the little speaker, handheld. And uh, come to find out, that same shell that went off, one fragmentation went through part, just part, of course, of that little radio. It wasn't so little, 70 pounds. And uh, I could uh, be heard, I could transmit, but I couldn't receive. So a day or two later, my battery gave out. I got the jeep, went back to my battery to get another battery, physical battery. So anyway, all the guys in my outfit back at Battery C, they were laughing like hell when I came in. And they said, Veer, you sure know the King's name. Wow, did we learn a few words from you. And it was my frustration cursing out. And they're talking back to me. Like, what, what, coor what are your coordinates? And I was, but I couldn't hear them. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yes. Now, I understand that uh, you won a silver star. Yeah, and I got a bronze star, Battlefield Commission. And would you believe it after all these stories? I got a good contact medal. <laughs> How did you win the Silver Star? Well, uh, oh, I didn't send it to you. I, I might have it here. All right. Uh, the Germans gave us a, a, a counterattack. And uh, they where, got... Where, but where were you at this point? Were you in the Hurricane or... Uh... Yeah, Groff's Howl. Uh, well, I never saw the actual... Bill. I just told later we were near Groff's. The goddamn forest was so thick you couldn't see... 25 yards down the goddamn road. And uh, what happened was the uh, Germans counterattacked and getting closer. So I knew 
the only thing to do was give coordinates for my position. We gave coordinates and they fired on us. But we got enough, we were dug in. We got enough crowds where we broke up the uh, counterattack. They had put a wedge between our lines. Our lines were very thinly held. And uh, so I later on got a uh, silver. If you want this, uh, I hope I brought up. I got photocopies of the certificate. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. Well, I wanted to hear from you. <laughs> oh, I see, yeah. Then I got a bronze star and all that. And, uh, uh, oh yeah, well, the second time I got hit, was it, I got hit twice just outside of Prague. Early in, about the second or third, second I guess it was, February 45, uh, I was with a Captain Lee, a hell of a nice guy out of Ogden, Utah. He was a rifle company commander. And so uh, there was this crest of a hill. Oh yeah, two things happened to me that day. And so uh, to get observation, I went up, this one house was still very much intact. There's a tall house right on top of the hill. So I went up to the attic. And of course, uh, I guess if I had thought twice, I would not have done it because it's a pretty conspicuous uh, observation post, that's what it comes down to. And anyway, uh, about the same time, I was told that I had core artillery behind me. Oh, that was a, a thrill. Uh, it gave me a sense of power that I've never had before or since. Because now I had 240s. And oh, Jesus, they make peanuts out of a 105 that I had. A 105 was designed for anti-personnel. Uh, 240 was to take a building down. And so uh, I got up there, and there was another house down in this valley in Crum right ahead of me. And there was a German tank there. So I thought, oh, that's a nice target. So, and I got uh, two, uh, two 40s, great. So the first shot, again, is always just to see where that first shell lands, and then you make your corrections from that. So I, I missed them. And so uh, anyway, uh, the Krauts in the tank first got out of the tank. Then when I got that one shell close to them, they probably were smart enough to know that some observer knew where they were, was honing in on them. So they came out and they pointed up this goddamn house. That's where I should have got my goddamn ass out of there fast. And before I could get another round off, uh, they just pointed that goddamn idiot up there. Wham! Next thing I knew, it was red as hell all over this goddamn attic. It's thick, so thick that, uh, well, you couldn't see anything in there. The only thing you could see was in the rear, some of the back wall of this attic was shot out. So I thought, that's where I'm gonna get my ass out, through there. So I got down my hands and knees, and just then a second shell hit, I guess right where I had been. And uh, at that point, I was knocked down, but just concussion. I was knocked down, I banged up my knee, and I was only gone for a couple of days and back into the outfit. Uh, but uh, when it came to, um, uh, artillery fire coming in on you. Uh, we had two or three cases. This wasn't at all unusual in combat, where it was friendly fire coming in from behind us. But the biggest problem is to tell those goddamn gunners back at the battery that they're mistaken, and they, they're coming in on us. Well, it's not me, it's not me, they're all defending themselves, bullshit. Finally, well, okay, we uh, finally survived that, but, um, the last time I got hit, uh, it was uh, early in the morning, March, yeah, that was March 2nd also. And uh, I had a replacement uh, for one of my two uh, enlisted men. Something happened to one guy. I got a, a raw ass recruit up there. And I looked him over and I said, where the goddamn living hell is your trench shovel? He said, well, he's another cracker. He said, ah, I said, oh, bullshit. I said, you goddamn idiot, you. And so uh, there was a German observer. He always gave the, the enemy credit for being just as smart, maybe smarter than you, because they were, they were smart. And uh, uh, we started takeoff, and uh, this guy didn't have a shovel. And I knew this guy was zeroing in on us, because one or two rounds were getting closer and closer. So I dug as fast as I could, and I was pooped out. I flipped the shovel over to him. I said, now you bastard, you dig your ass off. Now, come on, dig. And he was digging, and all of a sudden, 
I knew this goddamn shell was too close to us just from the sound of the trajectory. And he was on, in the tri slip trench, so he flattened himself out, and I got on top of him. I was right at ground level. And all of a sudden, the earth and everything flew up around me, and uh, it was like somebody hitting my ass with a baseball bat. See, when a shell breaks up, it's mad hot. This is steel breaking up. And uh, I know once or twice before, March the 2nd, when I was brand new in combat, picked up a piece of fragmentation and come down, but whoosh, you drop it fast, man hot. Well, I had two pieces crisscross, that's why I'm half-assed. I don't have a left buttock inside me. And it burned like hell. The two pieces that cut my shoulder and the one piece that I wish to hell I still had it went through my helmet and creased my head. That was just a superficial cut, a few stitches took care of that. So anyway, uh, I got hit, and then my battery commander, Higgins, uh, Roger E. Higgins, he came up and picked me up with a Jeep with a stretcher on it, and goddamn it, I was on the stretcher, we were going around a hairpin turn, and my goddamn helmet came off, went down this embankment. He stopped, he started to go after it, and I said, F it, and you know, let's get back, and all this kind of crap. And I wake up at night thinking, geez, it'd be a nice goddamn thing to give my grandchildren and all that, but <laughs> that's long gone uh, right now. But uh, the, uh, uh, the Germans were, um, they, they were mixed up, uh, like in the Hurricane Forest. They had a hell of a lot of artillery, an awful lot of artillery, and mortars too. And then, but the composure of the men themselves was real mixed up. You might get a real veteran, I'm talking uh, like prisoners, then you might pick up a, uh, a kid, 16 years old, something like that. There was a Jewish boy in our outfit. Of course, at that time in combat, we knew that uh, Hitler had concentration camps and all that and didn't like the Jews. We knew that much. But we didn't know to the extent, like six million Jews exterminated and all that stuff. But anyway, there was a guy named Green, and he and I dug uh, foxholes pretty close to each other. And I woke up the following morning, we didn't sleep much that night, and uh, I, th I thought, something's going on here. And this Jewish boy, Green, was sitting outside of his foxhole, and he was going like this with one hand and holding his M1 like this. And out of all this fog and crap came this, just a kid, I don't know, maybe he was 16 and all that. But then, see, what was happening then, uh, the Germans are scraping the bottom of the barrel and then have a mixture of seasoned troops with raw-ass uh, troops. Uh, but, uh, oh, uh, geez, uh, in that, that Hurricane Forest, uh, I can't say enough bad about it because the casualty rate was terribly high. There was one guy from uh, northern New Jersey. I was talking to him one time. When I was at college, we had a pretty good football team, and that was our common bond. He knew some of the guys were on that team and all that stuff. And he was a, uh, a first lieutenant but in the infantry. And anyway, one of these goddamn shells went off, and they picked him up with a stretcher and he came right by me. That poor bastard had his shoulder off, and actually the arm below it. I think he was already dead, but he had that stare. He, I felt like he was looking at me. Probably he was dead already then. But those kind of things stick in your mind. And where I have most of my trouble, like you'll read in that uh, little uh, application for 100%, uh, they, these flashbacks will come to me at night, and they'll be realistic as all goddamn hell. And the funny thing is, we, my wife and I raised six kids. When we had a house full of, like, six children, there's always action going on, something's always happening. And that took my mind off of combat, to a certain extent, to where I was not at least having nightmares. And then uh, after the kids got a little bit older and left, then they started to come back to me. And then one thing that accentuated this, and I spoke to this one of these support groups, uh, leaders, uh, I had a, well, she was 23 years old back in 86. And she was the apple of my eye. Oh God, she was a national honor student, good looking as hell. She and I were buddy buddies and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, she took off for our house up in Vermont at 6.30 in the morning. And uh, she wandered up there the night before with her fiance, and I said, oh, geez, it's raining down in Raleigh, up around Poughkeepsie, it's gonna be colder, there's gonna be ice up there. And so what happened was about uh, 8.30 or so, I was painting.
painting in my playroom, and looking down the window, going down the drive, and up comes a uh, New York State trooper and a local cop. I thought, this is strange. What the hell are those two guys doing? So they came up to the door, and they asked me to identify myself. So I said, I'm Jack Beer or John H. Beer, owner of the house. And uh, then they asked me, uh, what year was your daughter, Marilyn, born? I knew, goddamn, well, something was very wrong. So I said she was born in June of 1962. Then they announced they had bad news and that she was killed at 6.30. So anyhow, uh, I spoke to this one, oh, Ed Cook, he's a wonderful guy. He, I go to two different support groups with other guys that all got their own problems, Air Corps and tankers, whatever. Just small groups of us. We talk as we damn well please. I was at one of them this morning. So I said to this one guy, I was making up this uh, application for another interview on Houston Street. Mm -hmm. I said, should I put this down? He said, God damn right, Jack, he said, because that probably accelerated your like, deterioration and you're brought more vividly back to mind these uh, nightmares, these flashbacks and all that. So you'll see that in there too. That accelerated it. Was the, uh, was the second, did the second wound take you out of uh, the uh, war? Only for about two or three days, and then uh, my knee was swollen, it was black and blue. And, uh, but after that, I, I was able to walk, so I came right to hell. I wasn't hospitalized, just cut a little bit. Uh, oh yeah, the last time I was hit, uh, they didn't have any clusters. So they said, oh hell, three times, here. So I wound up with uh, two Purple Hearts and one cluster, so being like that. So uh, when did you come back home? Well, okay, I uh, about the uh, first or the second, about the second week, the second week of June of '45, I was checked out of this uh, convalescent hospital in Brahms Grove, England, uh, about the fourth or the fifth day of June '45, and then I was flown back to Brandenburg, where my outfit now the war is over, of course, by a month. And I met up with all of them. And so Captain Higgins, who had given me the battle of information, he and I were buddies right up until the day he died. And anyhow, uh, with uh, respect to uh, uh, that, I came back to my and I said, well, uh, where is this guy? I mentioned my name. Where is that guy? Where is somebody else? And they said to me, well, Veer, he had enough points. He was discharged. And I said, it's a pig's ass. I said, God damn it. Uh, I had 108 points more than anybody else in the outfit. They said, but Veer, you took a battlefield commission, so your points don't mean anything. And God damn it, they told me that uh, I and quite a bit of a regular uh, original outfit were going to go over to Japan. And the strange thing was, they said they're taking away, what do we call them, M1s. They were Sherman tanks with a 105 howitzer mounted on the front. And then where the turret had been, they mounted a, uh, an outdoor uh, 50 caliber machine gun. And of course, these were self-propelled, so they could move down the road fast and everything else. And they're going to give us the old-fashioned Toad 105s. And I thought, Jesus Christ, how many I shot up three times? Now I'm going to fight the goddamn Japs in Japan. And then the last day of my rehabilitation leave, they dropped the second atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And then the war was over, and I was mustered out in uh, Camp Butner, North Carolina. So what the... Uh what was your general impression of uh, your, your experience during World War II? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, you, I, I learned comradeship and made good friends, but then at the same time, I got it, like in with the infantry. The artillery didn't have casualties at all, like the infantry, mm -hmm. naturally. Uh, you're almost afraid after a while, after you lose a few, a few good buddies, of becoming too close to anyone because you figured. It's going to be tough when this guy gets knocked off. You always figured somehow or other you would get through, not the other guy. The, sometimes you have doubts on yourself getting through. But it, it formed a bond, like these two different support groups that I go to down in White Plains. One's on Broadway, one's on Hamilton Avenue. There's a common bound we all have, like three of these guys who are prisoners of war, and one in Japan, and uh, two of them over in Germany. And then other guys, uh, what a small world it is. There are two guys in our group on uh, the Wednesday mornings in White Plains on Broadway who grew up together in the same neighborhood in New Rochelle. And then they went into different outfits. One of them 
uh, went into the Air Corps, the other went into the infantry. One was shot down over, he's still in Germany, uh, and he was shot down in Germany. The same goddamn day his buddy was captured in Italy, got too far out in front of the rest of them. And they both were in prison camps and all that. But, you know, when you sit down with those guys, uh, there's just a common bound, a bond, I think you're part of bond, that makes you very close to them. Um, so, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Okay, and, uh, my 